All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, First Corinthians. We're going to go through this uh, epistle. Very, uh, still a very relevant epistle. Most Christians that have believed the gospel are halted in their spiritual growth. Something is stunting the spiritual growth of believers today. It's been a ama- it's been a problem ever since. It's it's actually the purpose of the of, of the book of Corinthians. The Corinthian church is a church in which the foundation has been laid and established. Paul tells you that in 1 Corinthians 3.10. He said, I've laid the foundation. He said, I've planted. I have fed you with milk. He, he tells them things like this over and over. The foundation had been established. The, 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 the doctrine and the faith had been taught to the Corinthian church, but the people aren't growing. They're not growing up. They're not becoming spiritual. The people have, even though the foundation had been laid, the people are not being established upon that foundation or they're not being established upon that foundation because something has come in and replaced the power of God in these people's lives. And what it was was the wisdom of men. Paul's going to identify that within the book of Corinthians. He said, when I came to you, he said, I didn't come flaunting my stuff. He said, I didn't come with excellency of speech and of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. He said, when I came to you, he said, I came in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And so the Corinthian church, instead of their faith being, instead of their faith being in the power of God, their faith is now in the wisdom of men. And Paul tells him, he says, when I come, he said, I'm not going to know the speech of a bunch of puffed up men. He said, I'm going to know the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. Amen. And so this represents a church that Paul had laid the foundation. He had established the foundation in this church. And yet these people are not established upon it. And they are undeveloped spiritually. They are not developing spiritually. Look at 1 Corinthians 1. Five. Goran talked a little bit about the gift of the grace of God this morning out of Ephesians 4. You know what, you know what Christ gave to his church? You know what, you know what he, some of the things he gave to his church? He gave them apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. For what purpose? The perfecting of the saints. And so the will of God for his church is for the saint to be perfected for the edification of the body of Christ. Right? Look at what Paul says there in, in 1 Corinthians 1, 4. I think, but we're going to look at these verses as we go through the epistle, but I just want you to get this. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ that in everything ye are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come what? Behind in no gift. That was, the per- that was what God's grace was doing, was, was enriching their speech and their knowledge for the purpose of them developing and not coming behind in the, in the gift of the grace of God. So what's going on in this church? That Paul... After he says, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. What happened to these people that Paul tells them, when I was first there, I couldn't give you meat because you weren't able to bear it. Neither yet now are you able to bear it. What happened? What's wrong with that church? Why are they not developing? Why are they not spiritually maturing? And because these people, Paul had laid the foundation but these people are under, underdeveloped spiritual, spiritually, they're yet carnal, and they build upon the foundation that Paul had laid with wood, hay, and stubble that is not going to make it into the world to come. The wisdom of men is not going to run the world to come. There's a wisdom that God has ordained before the world unto our glory. Amen? 
And this church was not learning it. This church is learning a bunch of puffed up wisdom of a bunch of carnal men. And they're taking the foundation that Paul had laid and they're now building upon it with wood, hay, and stubble which is going to burn up one day at the judgment seat of Christ. Amen? They're not building upon that foundation with the gold, silver, and precious stones of God's wisdom that was ordained. Listen, man, if you want to know what the wood, hay, and stub on the gold, silver, and the precious stones are of chapter 3, all you have to do is read the context of the book. That's all you have to do. What were the two things Paul was contrasting in 1 Corinthians chapter 2? The wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God. A wisdom that comes to nothing and a wisdom that was ordained by God unto eternal glory. That's the contrast. What is being built upon that foundation of Jesus Christ? Amen? And this church was building with wood, hay, and stubble rather than the gold, silver, and precious stones of God's wisdom ordained unto our glory and revealed by His Spirit. And these people never develop into that true spiritual habitation of God. The Corinthian church represents an immature church. That's what it represents. A church that has to, has to just, they have, because they have no spiritual discernment and they're not spiritual people, they're carnal, the only discernment and judgment they have pertains to the senses of their flesh. When they judge a preacher, it's based on what they can discern with their natural senses. When they judge a church, it's based upon their natural senses because they have no spiritual judgment. It's usually about the music, the activities, the building, the amount of people there. They have no judgment of the things of God. They are carnal, immature believers. And it's easy, it's easy to deceive people like that. Paul warned the Rome. The Corinthian church, what is it? It's a divided church, isn't it? You know why? Because they're carnal. Paul warned about it at the end of Romans. He says, now, brethren, I beseech you that you mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. Who gets deceived by good words and fair speeches? The simple. Because they don't have any spiritual judgment. No spiritual discernment of all. Amen? We're going to look at some of this stuff in this introduction. All right? Y'all let me know if that changed. Did that change? Can y'all see that verse? 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 9 and 10. Here Paul defines the ministry. A minister of this book. And until you start, until you guys start understanding stuff like this, man, listen, there's not, it's like, y'all remember Mike Huckabee? Y'all remember that guy? You know, claimed to be, you know, claimed to be a preacher and then ran for president. You talk about a demotion, man. Hey man, going from a preacher to, a, to the president in the United States, wow. You're talking about taking a hundred steps back. And see, people don't, people don't appreciate the ministry of this book enough. A minister of this book is a co-laborer with God. Remember when Paul says uh, that my labor be not in vain? We are doing something for God and laboring with God in what God is doing in eternity. Amen? The Constitution of the United States is going to get replaced one day, guys. Amen? And Paul says we are laborers together with God, and so he defines the ministry as a co-labor with God. What is the work? You. You're the work of the Lord. Didn't Paul say that in 1 Corinthians 9.1? 1? 
that ye are my work in the Lord. Right? You are the work of God. You are our labor. <coughs> now what are you? You're God's husbandry. Now what's the purpose of husbandry? <coughs> Produce fruit, isn't it? So what is the minister of God's word doing? Planting and watering to get you to grow up and bring forth fruit unto God. Amen? What else are we doing? What else are you? You're the building of God. A living building. Y'all ever seen a temple grow? Isn't that what Paul said? In whom the whole building groweth together into a holy temple in the Lord. We'll quote Peter. Peter said, you also as lively stones. What are you? You are living stones in the building of God. I believe you are the gold, the silver, and the precious stones. But you only become that as the minister of God puts the word of God in you. If all you have is earthly, carnal, fleshly wisdom in you, you're like wood, hay, and stubble in that building. Amen? So you are the building of God. That's the ministry. <coughs> Paul talks about this in Ephesians, but when he talks about it in Ephesians, he talks about it. You know who he's talking to here, guys? He's talking to carnal babies that understand buildings and husbandry. When he talks about it in Ephesians, he's talking to big boys. And he says, he says that the ministers were given for the perfecting of the saint and for the edification of the body of Christ. It is for individual perfection, growth and maturity of the individual believer for the, all those perfected believers to come together into a corporate unity as the building of God. What are we ultimately being built together for? A habitation of God through His Spirit. So ultimately, what are we? We're ministers of the Spirit of God. How many times does Paul say, God hath given unto us his spirit? Amen? How do we minister that spirit? Right there. If, you, if people truly understood that the spirit of God is in that book, not at an altar hanging out waiting for you to act the fool before you get a dose of him, you can have all the spirit of God you want by that book right there. And so we are the ministers of God's word, but look at what Paul says there. He says, according to the grace of God, pay attention to the words I got capitalized there, guys, because they're going to be important later. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a what? <coughs> Wise what? Y'all think Paul knew what he was doing? I think he knew what he was doing. Paul knew exactly, as a wise master builder, I have what? Laid the foundation. Paul knew what to teach first. He knew how to build this building. <clears throat> Even if most men don't today. Paul knew. According to the grace of God given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. So Paul knew what he was doing, right? It's going to get a little boring for a second. We're going to get into some history here. That's a map of Paul's, that's a map of Paul's journeys going up into Corinth. Remember the Jerusalem council down here? Where did he go after that in Acts 15? Went back to Antioch. Him and Barnabas have a big falling out there. Barnabas takes Mark with him, and Paul leaves with Silas. Right in Acts, in Acts 15, 41, it says they traveled through Syria and the regions of Cilicia, confirming the churches. Right? That's this area right here. Then it says they come in 16, 1, they come to Derby and Lystra. That's where he picks up Timothy, isn't it? Right? Acts 16, they go through the regions of Galatia and are forbidden to go where? Asia, right there. Then they wanted to go up into here. 
and the Spirit forbade them. And they come over here to Troas, and that's where Paul gets the Macedonian call, the dream of the Macedonian. Right? Acts 16, 12, he comes to Philippi. That's why how West Virginians say it, brother, Philippi. <laughs> then he comes into Thessalonica, Berea, who were more noble than the Thessalonians. And from here he goes into Athens. You read about all that? That's where he preaches in Acts 17. You men of Athens, I perceive that, you, that in all things you are far too superstitious. He preaches that, Acts 17. Right, right there. Now, after that, where does he go? Acts 18 and 1. And after he departed Athens, he came to Corinth. Right? Now, how long was he in Corinth? It's right there in verse 11. After these things, Paul departed from Athens, came to Corinth. Now, he spent 18 months there teaching. I just want you to get the foundation of this epistle. After 18 months of teaching there, Paul goes to Ephesus. Apollos goes to Corinth. Right? That's how Acts 18 ends. Paul goes to Jerusalem, keeps a feast. He comes back to Ephesus and spends two years at Ephesus. Paul writes 1 Corinthians towards the end of that two years that he's at Ephesus. You're talking about close to four years after he had first been to Corinth. But I want you to get this right here. He continued there a year and six months doing what? Teaching the word of God. And I don't believe it was 45 minutes on Sunday. I believe Paul was there 540 days ministering the word of God among the Corinthian church. When he, looked, when he laid that foundation for the Corinthians, it consisted of 18 months of teaching the word of God among them. Problem with most Christians, listen, the Corinthian church had a, bigger, had a better foundation than most Christians in America do today. Amen. A lot of people don't take the Bible serious. They just don't. 18 months he was there teaching the word of God among them. 18 months teaching it. People, people today act like 35 minutes too much to ask. And then wonder why they have no discernment of the spiritual things of God. People's like, oh, you're over my head. Ain't no wonder. Amen? Part of that Bible's like milk. Part of it's meat. Problem ain't me. The problem's in your head. If there's part of that book you can't discern and understand, it's because your head is messed up. Amen? All Paul did for them 18 months was teach them people milk. Look, I'm going to show you. Take it from his own mouth. What's Paul mean there? And our brethren could not. He's talking about when he first came to them. What did he tell them back in chapter 2 when I, he said, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. He says, but we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. But he says, and I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual. So the 18 months Paul was teaching the word of God there, he couldn't speak to them as spiritual men. He had to speak to them as carnal men. For 18 months, all Paul taught them was what? Milk. So for eight, listen. Paul considered laying a foundation. He considered laying a foundation 18 months of milky Bible teaching. You getting it? We're going to see what the milk was. But he said, he says, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. What's wrong with them? They're underdeveloped. They're spiritually immature. When it comes to the word of God, these people were babies. There were things that you could not talk to them about. Amen? Y'all ever read things like 
the peace of God that passeth understanding. Would y'all think that's milk or meat if it passes understanding? Y'all ever read things like to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge? Y'all think that's milk or meat? Meat ain't the four dimensions of the universe. Meat ain't who wrote Hebrews. What did the seven thunders of Revelation say? That ain't meat. Meat in that Bible is the spirit of God. The deep things of the mind of God. To know his love, his long suffering, his patience. To have those things working in you by God's spirit. But carnal babies, how, how, is, a, how is a carnal man going to discern the love, a love that passes Knowledge. See, we're talking about spirit. Listen, listen. I've watched it, man. I've talked about that. I've talked about this stuff in this church, man. I've been in, I've, I've been going to church since I was about this big right here. I've had a long time to observe Christians, man. I've had a long time to observe them. I've been in church services, man, where they get up and for an hour they sit and play good sounding music, man. The people's all into it. And as soon as that book gets open, temperature drops in the room. Because you're going from the realm of carnality to spirituality. And they have no discernment of it. Amen. I'm telling you folks. Paul says you're yet carnal. So the 18 months Paul was there when he said he laid the foundation. He tells you in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 what that foundation was. It was a foundation of milk meant to develop these Corinthian believers from carnal to spiritual, right? There's the diagram. The Word of God exists in two forms, milk and meat. Who's the milk for? What's it for? So that they can do what? Receive meat. There's part of that Bible that's like milk. And there's part of that Bible like meat. That tells me that the word of God progresses from milk to meat to transform a man and develop a man from a carnally minded man to a spiritually minded man. By the time you get to Romans 8, Paul starts talking about walking after the spirit and being spiritually minded. Well, then obviously Romans 8 is part of this doctrine that's transforming you from the carnal to the spiritual. So when Paul says things like know this and know that, know this and know that, that knowledge is taking you from a carnal man to a spiritual man. <clears throat> the foundation's laid, guys. Everything you need to be spiritual is given to you right there. And people that are underdeveloped and they're not spiritually growing up and all this stuff and <clears throat> they're looking for some religion to do it, that book's the only thing that is going to do it. Amen? Paul, Paul tells us here that he fed with milk, not with meat, for they were not able to bear it. And so Paul was trying to develop these Christians into, into mature believers through, through feeding them with milk to help them grow up into spiritual men that can discern the deep things of God. Amen? Look at, uh, look at 1 Corinthians 2.13. I don't know if I put that verse up here or not. No, nope. that'll be the next one though. Look at verse 13, man. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. You see that? We're going to talk about this verse in a little bit. Do you understand that a man that understands the wisdom of God, a man that understands the, the deep things of God and and has known those things and is now speaking those things, 
He speaks in a way that the Holy Ghost has taught him to speak. Amen. He's got a vocabulary taught to him by the Holy Spirit of God comparing spiritual things with spiritual. What does the Spirit of God search, guys? The deep things of God. And so as you're being taught by the Spirit of God searching those deep things of God, the Spirit of God is comparing spiritual things with spiritual and He's teaching you the words of God's wisdom. Amen. And I'm telling you, as a spiritual man that's been studying that book for a long time, the words of God's Spirit are bankrupt in American Christianity. They're completely absent. Completely absent. Even when I hear a Christian try to take a verse in that Bible to preach some corrupt doctrine, because I have a spiritual mind, I can hear the way they use a verse and tell you they're contradicting 25 other verses. Corn drew five of them up there this morning. You are completing him. Amen? And the way they teach that verse and try to explain that verse, they're contradicting 85% of what Paul wrote in his epistles. Those are not spiritual men. Amen. Not everybody running around thinking they understand a Bible verse is spiritual. All right, and so when Paul, when Paul tells him he comes, when he's going to come to Corinth, look at 1 Corinthians 4.19. I've already quoted the verse. I'm trying to get you to understand what's going on in Corinth, what's going on in American Christianity. The biggest problem in American Christianity and why so many Christians are not growing up is because Christians are not rooted and grounded in the power of God. They're rooted and grounded in the wisdom of man who set up some system. And you can't go against the system. And it's just all this contention and striving and division and denominationalism. Amen. Guys, that book, that book is not like some college education. That book is a living spirit. You can't Greek your way into knowing it, Hebrew in your way and into knowing it. God wants you to have an intimate relationship with his spirit in that book. I guarantee you, I guarantee you the world, if they would have saw the Corinthian church compared to like the Philippian church, they would have loved the Corinthian church. They were rich and full and reigning as kings and they were excellent in their speech. The world would have loved it. Amen. That's, that's what following your natural man's going to get you. Paul says, 1 Corinthians 4, 19. And I tell you, man, I've, I've, I've read this book enough, guys. I've read this book enough to know. Y'all can get upset with me. Y'all can get mad. Y'all can do whatever you want to. Though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge. Amen. We use great plainness of speech. Paul says when he comes, he says, I will not know the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. Guys, I'm telling you right now, the word of God works in me. I wouldn't have survived the last year and a half of my life if I didn't have the power of God working inside of me. And I'm telling you right now, what I've gone through would destroy most carnal people. I'm telling you, but it ain't me. It's Christ in me. It's that book working in me. And I walk around and I look at the visible Christian world. I look at, I look, we have a foundation laid and all this. And I look at the visible Christian world. You know what I see? I see a bunch of godless people puffed up in knowledge 
speaking things they don't know and understand, and there's no power of godliness anywhere. Amen. <clears throat> Peter says, what is milk designed for? I've already, I've already showed you in the diagram. The word of God progresses from milk to meat to develop the carnal man into a spiritual man. What does Peter say there? Desire what? The sincere milk of the word that you may what? <clears throat> So what is milk designed to do? Get you to grow up. Amen? Get you to grow up. Right? And so listen, man. You mean that, listen. Are you going to tell me that the man given the grace of God for this work? You know what Paul was, what was Paul laboring to do, guys? What was he laboring to do and striving to do according to the power that worked in him? Present every man perfect in Christ Jesus through preaching and teaching. And you mean to tell me the man that was given the grace for this work to present every man perfect through his preaching and teaching that his epistles are not laid out in progressive form for the growth and edification of a believer? If God's work progresses milk to meat, how many of y'all think God's going to put the meat before the milk? Now you're going to start understanding why Corinthians and Galatians have similar characteristics. They're the only two epistles that mention leaven. Paul quits using the phrase, no you're not, after you get out of Galatians. Did y'all know that? He never uses it again. Now think about it. Maybe Romans through Galatians is that milk for the babe to help grow him up. And as you get into Ephesians, you're now going, but I just want you to understand right now that the milk is only designed to get you to grow. Now you're going to be amazed at what the milk is when we get to it. You're going to be Amazed at what this milk is. But guys, the whole Bible is laid out in the form that I'm talking about, a progression from milk to meat. Y'all ever read Leviticus? How much of y'all, how many of y'all love the book of Leviticus? Okay, we got one back there. She Aurora. <laughs> I tell you right now, when I know Leviticus is coming, I start dreading it. Amen? It's about a bunch of slaughter of animals and what to do with the fat and the inward parts and making up meat offerings and drink offerings and consecrating the priest and his garments and all that stuff, man. It bores me to death. How many of y'all understand the book of Leviticus? Y'all know what that book is? Milk? It's what it is. Every one of those priests, God gave them priests an ordinances of divine service. What was the purpose of those priests? They serve unto what? Zada and shadow of heavenly things. That was their whole purpose. God was using that tabernacle and those Levitical ordinances to give Israel an example and a shadow of heavenly things. That was their whole purpose. You're not going to understand the heavenly things if you didn't understand the example and the shadow. And if I'm right on this, what's the strong meat? What's the milk? That means the books of Moses back there was milk. And the average Christian world couldn't hold a five-minute conversation about any of it. Amen? Altars. Where do we get altars in churches? They have no idea what any of it is about. 
Amen? Why do we have shadows? Because a bunch of people don't understand the example and shadow of those things. Amen? Those priests were serving unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. Look at Hebrews chapter 5. Called of God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are what? Dull of hearing. Why? For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again. Again. Paul's going to, you know what, you know how Paul's going to fix the Corinthian church? Send Timothy there and bring them into remembrance. Amen? You have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God and become such as have need of and not a strong meat. What's the meat? Jesus Christ, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. What's the milk? What's the milk? The first principles of the oracles of God right here. Those examples and shadows. In other words, if they didn't learn what the example and shadow was, they're not going to understand the meat. How are they going to understand the high priest in the heavenly places if they didn't understand the example and shadow of heavenly things? Let me explain it to you like this. Christ told Nicodemus, he says, the wind bloweth, bloweth where it listeth, and you see it, but you cannot tell from whence it came. And he said, so is everyone born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said, how can these things be? He said, art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? He shamed him. Why? Nicodemus was a master of Israel and completely ignorant of the word of God. Christ said, I have told you earthly things, and you believe not. How then shall I tell you of heavenly things? Amen? Everything God used in that, guys, and the point I'm making here is as you go through the Bible, God is progressing in his word from milk to meat, and he's taking you from carnal people the reason he uses milk is because you're carnal, so he uses earthly shadows and examples to help you understand spiritually, and as you're understanding it, you're becoming a spiritual man. How many times did Paul speak like this? I speak after the manner of men. What's he doing? He's talking in a way you can understand. To try to get you to, under, to go from a carnal man to a spiritual man. Look at, look at uh, Hebrews 5, 13 and 14. For everyone that useth milk is what? Circle it. Put a big highlight through it. Underline it five times. There are people in the Bible that use the Bible that are unskillful in the Bible. Every man, everyone that useth Get it? Useth milk is unskillful. You know what a Seventh day Adventist is? He's using milk. Amen. He's going back to the, print, the first principles that were nothing more than in a shadow, an example of things to come. And he's using that milk and he's unskillful in the word of righteousness for he is a Babe, but strong meat belongeth to them that are full of age. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So there are people, there are Christians who use milk, they have need of milk, and they are unskillful in the word of righteousness. Strong meat belong to them that are full of age. They're spiritually mature. And what is the mark of a man that's spiritually mature? Discernment. Paul said, he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Yet he himself is judged of no man. What is the, so what do you think the mark of a baby is? No 
judgment or discernment of spiritual truths. They couldn't tell a lie from the truth if it jumped up and smacked them right between the eyes. They couldn't tell the devil from God if their lives depended on it. That's why you got millions and millions of Roman Catholics that'll go snot and slobber all over the Pope every time he shows up. You know why? Listen, if it chaps you, it chaps you. They don't have any sense. Common or spiritual. Amen. Oh, I don't like that preacher. Well, get over it. Look at Isaiah 28. You know, Amer you know, you know what, man? We live in a society today. Remember when Paul tells Timothy, notice what he says. Preach the word. I love what David Osteen said one time here. He said, I'll tell you something I'm thankful for the Baptist church. He said, they taught me how to preach. Amen. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't have right division, but they taught me how to preach. And that's something that's missing in mid-Acts churches is preaching. Paul tells Timothy, preach the word. What did Paul consider preaching? Reproving, rebuking, and exhorting. And he said, for there will come a time when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust heap to themselves what? Teachers, teachers, not preachers. You know what Americans need? You know what Christians in America need? They need that old school preaching that'll pick them up, kick them in the slacks a little bit. That's what they need. They don't need this coddling all the time and this Bible teaching that's impersonal. Paul's going to be so hard with the Corinthian church, guys, that after he writes... This letter to them, he immediately regrets it. Y'all are probably, here's going to be the difference. Y'all might leave here and be mad at me. I'm going to go home and be heartbroken that I might have been too rough with you this morning. That's the difference. Amen? But the reality is, man, is we, we live in a world where the Corinthian church is the norm. The book of Ephesians, you, you, it'd be hard to even teach the truths of Ephesians in most churches in America. They don't even know they're eternally secure. They still think they're doing their part to get to heaven. Those people don't need meat, they need milk. Amen? Look at Isaiah 28. What I'm talking about here is this word of God progressing from milk to meat to transform you from a carnal to a spiritual man. Whom shall he teach knowledge? Good question. And whom shall he make to understand what? Them that are, get the word, weaned from the, and drawn from the breast, meaning you're never going to understand doctrine if you don't go from milk to meat. Milk is designed to develop you to understand doctrine. You're not to live on the milk. What, what, is, what, is, what is the picture God is painting here? He's painting a child that's not on his mother's breast for the rest of his life, but a child that's being brought off of that breast until he's weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast, he can't understand doctrine. Now God explains the process of doing that. Here's how he weans and draws from the breast. For precept must be upon what? Precept. Precept upon precept Line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. You know what that means? As you progress from the book, as you progress through that book, 
You're in the process of being weaned from milk and drawn from the breast. The word of God is, is progressively going from milk to meat. And as you get further and further into the book, God is making you to understand doctrine. Meaning, meaning you take, you take these little, you take these little creeds of, of men. We believe this, 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 and this. And here's the six verses for why. Just shoot it plumb full of holes, man. Throw that stuff in the trash. Right here is what I believe. I believe Genesis 1, 1, Revelation chapter 22. Line upon line, precept upon precept. Amen. I, guys, I hope, you, I hope you understand what I'm talking about because it's why there's no power in the Christian church anymore. It's why Christianity has become a bunch of carnal people who live in the world system and follow the ways of the world and then come to church for 45 minutes on Sunday. And nothing in this book affects one decision of their life throughout the rest of the week. They do not have this book living inside of them. They don't hear it throughout the day. They don't have it shining in their hearts, reproving and rebuking them. They don't have it instructing them in the ways of righteousness. It's just a religion. Amen. Isaiah tells you there that, that God makes men understand. Paul says the same thing. How does the Spirit of God teach us? How does he do it? Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. You're only going to understand that book as you go precept upon precept, line upon line. Amen. Now what was the foundation Paul laid in Rome? Or in, in Corinthians. I just gave you the answer. Remember what he said. He said, according to the grace of God given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. By whom we have received grace and apostleship for what? So what do you think the foundation Paul laid in Corinth was? It had to be the faith, wasn't it? What was given to him by the grace of God was to bring obedience to the faith among who? All nations. That means when Paul went into Corinth, he preached the faith to the Corinthians. That's the foundation he laid. And I hate, I hate to always point this out. You see that word, the? That's definite. Meaning that is defined. And if you don't know it, you're not obedient. If I, if I set you down and I said, what's the faith? Could you define it? Now you're sitting there thinking, well, I don't know if I could or not. Amen? You realize we're talking about milk. If I'm right, then Romans is the milk. All that stuff over there about walking in newness of spirit and walking in newness of life, serving in newness of spirit, being led by God's spirit as his sons and suffering. Guess what, guys? The sufferings of this present time are part of the milk God wants you to understand so you can think spiritually. Amen? A carnal, listen, listen, we're all going to face the sufferings of this present time, but you've got people that are carnal and people that are spiritual in dealing with those sufferings of this present time. The faith, that this is the faith right here. That's the foundation. Look at verse, look at this verse. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some, here's the way, here's the way religious people read that. Now 
That's how they read it. Paul already told you what he got. I received grace for obedience to the faith. And I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. To the end you may be established. That is that I may be comforted together with you by the both of you and me. What did Paul what did Paul consider being established there? Being brought into the mutual faith. The Corinthians, what are they? They're in a hundred different divisions. Why? That foundation Paul had laid, neglected. They're not established upon it. Y'all understand? The point I'm making is this. 18 months Paul was in Corinth and he had laid the foundation of that church and we know what that foundation is. God has set these books in the order that you are to read them. You don't jump straight to Ephesians without what's first been established to develop you into a spiritual man that can understand Ephesians. Amen. Look at, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. What was the problem in Corinth? Paul had been there. Same reason. What, listen, listen. I know, I know that I get picked on and we joke about it and stuff like that. Guys, that's why we go to Romans a lot here. We're going to continue to do it. As long as I'm pastor. Romans is an important book. Amen. Every major heresy in the world today I can trace back to ignorance of something in Romans. If people understood that Roman doctrine, the state of American Christianity wouldn't be in the shape that it's in. Look at what Paul says now, 1 Corinthians 2, 4 through 5. My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. The 18 months Paul was there, Paul wasn't trying to entice them with the words of man's wisdom. What did Paul demonstrate in the 18 months that he was at Corinth, he demonstrated the spirit and power of God. Amen. Why? That your faith should not stand where? In the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Guys, you can stand on your own if you get your faith right. Nothing makes me mad when people try to correct me with another man. Keith Blade said, oh yeah, trust me, I know. I've read Keith too. Keith Blades ain't my Bible. Love Keith. Think he was a great dynamite Bible teacher. But I've got disagreements with him and where I disagree with him doesn't come out of my head. It comes out what I've found in the Bible. Now, if you want to come have a discussion with me about the Word of God, we'll do it. You prove to me I'm wrong by the Word of God, I'll change. But I'm not going to change because some man said, this is what I believe. I found all kinds of errors in every man I've ever studied. I found errors in all of them. I've got mine too. You can stand on your own, guys, if your faith gets rooted and grounded in the power of that book. And quit just regurgitating something you hear some other man say. That's how systems form. That's how movements start. And those movements fade when the man dies. But the word of our Lord endureth forever. 
This stuff right here ain't going to die with the man. Paul said, when I was there, I preached these things and I've demonstrated the spirit and power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So what happened to the Corinthian church? Interestingly, the book of Romans begins and ends with power. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is what? Power of God unto salvation. Everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul addresses this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, doesn't he? We preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, a stumbling block. And unto the Greeks, foolishness. But unto you that are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. The Corinthian church had received this gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation. But he closes Romans with this power of God to establish you. According to what? My gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Have y'all read how Corinthians begins? Christ sent me not to baptize but to preach the gospel. Chapter 2. We speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world which cometh to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. The Corinthian church was not ready to receive the rest of this because they're no longer rooted in the power of God. Their faith is now in the wisdom of men. You got it? This is how, listen guys, if, if, if y'all if are with me this morning and, and you're understanding this stuff, it will give you discernment of Fairmont, West Virginia and the world around you. There's church after church after church after church after church filled up with a bunch of people who don't even know if they're going to heaven when they die. And then I get up here and I, I call them a hell hole. People get all bent out of shape with me saying that stuff because they don't read their Bibles. Proverbs chapter 9 talks about a foolish woman that stands calling for the same people that the woman of wisdom is. And when she brings those people into her house, the Bible says her guests are in the depths of hell. There is a foolish religious system in this world calling to men, simple men who lack understanding and they're bring, she's bringing them into her house. And those that go in unto her are in the depths of hell right now. It's a hell hole. There's churches in this world that are not, have, they don't have anything. Listen guys, if you're honest with me, this is the first time, this is the first place y'all heard this stuff. Paul had laid this foundation. He, was, he gave them the doctrine that they needed to develop them spiritually so that they could comprehend these further parts of the Word of God to become fully established people by the power of God in obedience of faith. So what happened to the Corinthian church? Why after all this time, Paul says... Neither yet now are ye able, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envy, strife, contention, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? We are all of Christ. You know who Christ is? Our wisdom our righteousness, our sanctification, and our redemption. What do you have that you did not receive? And if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as though thou didst not receive it? Don't you glory in me or Jordan or David Osteen. If any man's going to glory, let him glory in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Because anything that I've said that's done anything in you or anything Corin has said or anything David Osteen has said, anything that any of us has ministered to your inner man through the word of God, it came from Jesus Christ, nobody else. And when you start building up the movements around the men, you've now halted the spiritual development and growth and maturity of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You say, what's wrong with Ruckmanism? Ruckman? Amen. What's wrong with the mid acts dispensationalist? Men following? There's truth. When you start following men, chapter 4, and I'm going to be done, and we're going to get into this book next week, guys. What halted the spiritual growth of the Corinthians was their faith was now standing in the wisdom of man. Paul's cure for that. Last verse on here. First, well, 1 Corinthians Wherefore, who were they following? They were following the wise. See, the natural man and the spiritual man judges things differently. The natural man was following what appeared to be wise in the world. Paul said, let no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinketh it seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a what? Fool. The Corinthians were following what looked like wisdom. They were following what looked strong. And they were following what looked honorable. But Paul said, we are fools. We are weak. We are despised. Now you think the natural man wants to follow what's foolish, weak, and despised? No, he wants to follow what's wise, strong, and honorable. But what did God choose? He chose the foolish, the weak, and things despised to confound and bring to nothing the things that are wise, mighty, and honorable in this world. This is the power, Paul says, when I come, I'm going to know this power. And so the Corinthians were following the wrong type of people. So when Paul says, I beseech you, be ye followers of me, for this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord. You know what the churches need today? They need those beloved sons of Paul. They need those faithful men in the Lord for what purpose? Bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in Christ. Get the last part as I teach everywhere and in every church. You getting it? What did the Corinthian church need? They needed course correction. Not some new thing. They needed somebody to come in there to bring them in remembrance of what Paul had already taught them. To get their faith Established back where it needed to be established. Amen? So what we're talking about here now is Romans being milk, being the foundation that had already been laid, and the Corinthian church is a church that's faith has been perverted, drawn away from those things, and they're now stuck and halted, and they're not growing and developing into spiritual people. What are some of the marks of them, guys? I promise you, I'm done right here. What are some of the marks of these Corinthian babies? Contentions? Strife? Envy? Divisions? No spiritual discernment. Reports of gross immorality. Reports of fornication among them. And no guts to judge it. 
You know how many times Paul condemns the Corinthian church of ignorance in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 alone? Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? Know ye not the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Know ye not that, they, that he that joins himself to a harlot is one flesh? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost? Over and over. He's saying that whole context of that fornicator and the way they handled it, Paul gets to the root of the problem and he says you handled it this way because you're stupid. You don't know anything. When we allow fornication and stuff like that to go on in the midst of the body of Christ and not judge those things, shame on us. And then have the audacity, I'm complete Christ. You filthy dog. A Christian that despises uncleanness or a, a Christian that despises cleanness and holiness is a Christian that despises God and His Spirit. They asked Dr. Ruckman one time, they said, why did you go to Bob Jones, Dr. Ruckman? He said, because I'd never been anywhere pure in my life. He said, I wanted to go somewhere clean and pure. Amen. Christians have so settled into the filth of this world, it's pitiful. They become comfortable in the hog pen. The more, I, the more this book gets inside of me, the more I just long to go somewhere pure and clean and holy where my Savior is, man. Get out of this vile place. Those are some of the marks of a man. And then when they finally ask you a Bible question, it's about fornication and what they eat. Who, who can I marry and have sex with and what can I put in my belly? That's the questions they asked Paul. With fornication, division, contention, fighting, all this stuff going on in the Corinthian church, they wrote Paul a letter and said, who can I marry and what can I eat? Oh yeah. That's the marks of them. They don't understand gifts, the, the excellent way of charity and the edification of the body of Christ. Guys, when I come over here on Sundays, and I'm going, I'm going to pray. When I come over here on Sundays, when I sit and study stuff like that, and I come over here and I get a little rough or get a little mean and might make you uncomfortable, you might go home and hate my guts or don't like the way I preach, guys. When I go home and I spend day after day after day in that book, studying these things and comparing Scripture and, 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 and putting this stuff together, it's because I love you as my Lord's body, and I want to see you built up, grow up, because I know that we're going to be presented to the Lord one day for a glorious purpose that we were given in Christ before the world began. And not only do I want you to be presented pleasing to the Father one day when that day comes, but I want us all to be able to participate in the aspect of it that God is doing today in the ministration of His Word. I want to see this church grow into a church, man, where we got people downstairs teaching little kids this milk. So when they become teenagers one day, guys, they ain't starting from scratch. You know, you don't have to be sitting here teaching Corinthians to be a Bible teacher, guys. Children need taught the Word of God. I want that, I just want, you should be talking about these things in your home, studying these things in your home. Any questions on any of this? Next week, we're going to start chapter 1, verse 1. I'm not going to give an outline of the book or anything. We'll figure out the outline as we go. Next week, we're going to start in chapter 1, verse 1, and we're going to start going through that book. And the design of that book, the purpose of that book is to bring these Corinthians into great sorrow. That's the purpose of the book. So it's going to get uncomfortable with you if you ain't, if you ain't living straight. Because the purpose of the book is to bring sorrow unto repentance. Paul tells you that in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and you've got to read 2 Corinthians in connection. Paul keeps mentioning the present epistle and the former epistle within 2 Corinthians. They are meant to be read in, in connection with each other. The design of the first epistle and the design of the second epistle. Reproof to repent 
and then course correction and instruction in 2 Corinthians to bring those Corinthians back into order. Amen. All right. Uh, comrade, you want to pray? You care too?